We've had them work on Miss Hargrove's uh, sewing machine. Uh, they're not generally fast, but I believe that, I believe they're fast.
Let us bow as we pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day that you bless us with. Thank you for the beautiful sunshine, the beautiful blue skies, all the blessings you give us each day. Father, help us to be good stewards of the blessings you give us and always use them to the glorifying of your precious name. In the precious name of your Son and our Lord and Savior Jesus, that we sacrifice for our sins. Father, we know that you accepted that sacrifice because you raised him up on the third day. Thank you, Father, for each home, each family here this morning. We pray your richest blessings on each one. We pray you to bless those that would like to be here but can't because of physical illnesses or other problems beyond their control. We pray that you'll bless them, bless those that have had surgery, those that are undergoing treatments and tests. It be your will, their health, and their story. Father, comfort those that have lost loved ones recently as only you can. And help us to do what we can to comfort them in any way that we can. Father, we pray your blessings on our elders here at Ephesus. Pray that you'll give them wisdom in all their decisions. Help us as, as members here to follow their guidance. Father, be with us as we're about to assemble to our classes, be with the teachers, give them a good recollection of the things they've studied, teach them in a way that we can understand. Help us to not only be hearers of your word, but doers, and be pleasing in your sight. Continue with us now and through this worship on through future life. When we've come to the end of life's way, by your grace and mercy, give us a home in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Welcome you here this morning. We appreciate your being here with us in our Bible study. We're still in the book of 1 John. We are in chapter 5. We read a good bit of it last week and, and talked about a good bit of it. Uh, John, uh, Diane and I were talking about this morning. 1 John is not one of the books that you think of as being a real difficult book. You think about maybe Romans or Hebrews or Revelation when you start talking about difficult books in the New Testament. And yet, in my experience, the book of 1 John is about as hard, if not harder, to understand than, than any of it. Uh, John says a lot of things that just, on the surface, really seem puzzling and don't seem to fit some things that I've been taught all my life and things that I believe. And yet, I think as you look at 1 John, you have to sort of understand John's style of writing, number one. Uh, you understand the, some of the concepts behind what he's saying, and we've mentioned already the fact that he uses a lot of continual action verbs, and he uses the idea of, of except, for example, of obeying his commandments, not in an absolute sense of, of always doing everything exactly right, but in the sense of being committed to doing that of obeying his commandments. He talks about uh, other things like that uh, very often believing in Jesus, confessing Jesus, and so on. Uh, and he's not just saying that all you got to do to go to heaven is believe in Jesus, and yet that is what he says <laughs> on two or three different occasions. 
And, and yet I think if you understand the, the way he writes and the context of, of all that he says, that it helps you to understand it. So you, you have to look at it from a little different perspective than, than some of the uh, other books that, that you study and read. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about them, and we've already talked about some of them already. Uh, in, in verse 5, he said, Who is the one who overcomes the world? But who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only with water only, but with water and with blood, and it's the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is true. For there are three that bear witness, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for the witness of God is this, that he has borne witness concerning his Son. The one who believes in the Son of God is witnessing himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed in the witness that God has borne concerning his Son. And the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, he who does not have the Son does not have life. If you go back up to question number seven, which we talked about a little bit about last week, he says, what do we mean when we talk about overcoming the world there in verse five? The one who, uh, the one, and who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. If you go back up to verse four, uh, he said, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Uh, I think we talked about what does it mean to overcome the world. Uh, and, and we basically said we don't let the world control us. We don't let the world control our thinking. And if, if you think about it, and John does this a lot, he'll talk about a subject and then later he'll talk about the same subject again, then maybe later he'll talk about it the, the third time. And so you have to sort of go back and look at different things that John says. And if you remember back in chapter 2, uh, in verse 15, a passage that all of us are familiar with, he says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If one loves the world, the love of the Father is not any. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and most of the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. And he's saying the same thing there that he says over here in our text. He's saying that if we are committed to serving God and we're living for Him by faith, then we overcome the world. We overcome all of these things that, that are around us. Now, does that mean we don't ever mess up and sin? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means that our life is geared toward serving God and committed toward serving God and being what God wants us to be. So I think that, that, uh, that we have to look at all of this in its context. All right, any questions? We talked about that some last week. Any other comment or question on that? All right, question number eight. If the coming of Jesus by water, and that's in verse six, uh, refers to his baptism, then to what would be by the blood? What does that refer to? His death, okay. His crucifixion, yeah. I think that's right. Uh, that to me seems to be the best explanation. He came by water. Uh, he was baptized in the early part of his ministry. He came by water and blood. And blood would refer to uh, the when he was crucified. Well, in that baptism, is before we come in contact with the blood? We do, yes, but not Jesus. Yeah. This is talking about Jesus. Yeah. So, you know, he was baptized. Now, the well, let's look at that. Who are the three who bear witness in heaven? Uh, the Word and the Holy Ghost. Okay. Uh, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we know the Father is Father God. Who is the Word? Let's talk about Jesus, yes. And then the Holy Spirit. Now, I think as you look at that in connection with what we just said, verse 6 and 7, he says, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with the water and with the blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is true. For there are three that bear witness, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. So he first said that the witness is that Jesus came by water and by blood. Now he inserts the Spirit. Where was the Spirit involved in the coming of Jesus? Okay, God, the angel appeared to Joseph or to Mary and said, that which is in you is 
begotten of the Holy Spirit. So, so Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's the first place. All right, what about at his baptism? The Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove and landed on his landed on him and then the voice from heaven spoke. Uh, and so there you had the witness of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, even at the baptism of Jesus when he was baptized. And God spoke and said, This is my beloved Son, the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove. So so you have the witness of the three on multiple occasions in his life and so on. All right, uh, number 10, we already answered that. Who is the word? Uh, it's Jesus. Uh, if you go back to John chapter 1, you remember he, he begins by saying, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word was God, and, and everything that was made was made by God. And so and then when you get down in verse 14, he said, and he became flesh and dwelt among us. I talk about the word. And so there's no question there in 1 John, that he's, or in John 1, that he's talking about Jesus is the word. Uh, also, as as we began even here in First John, and we talked about it back in chapter one, uh, in verses one through three, he he says that uh, what was from the beginning we have heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we beheld our hands and handled concerning the word of life, and then he goes on to, and talks about it, and it's obvious that he's talking about Jesus. Right? So Jesus is referred to as the Word many, many times throughout Scripture. Uh, we talked about this already, but what three bear witness on earth? The Spirit, the water, and the blood. Okay, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Now that's who bears witness on earth. And then he says, uh, Whose, whose witness is greater, the witness of God or the witness of man? Obviously the witness of God, yeah. Uh, the, the passage that Jacob just read from the book of Acts chapter 6, I believe it is, uh, that he read from, and, and he was talking about uh, Peter uh, was, was being questioned by the council and so on, and they strictly commanded the apostles to not teach any more in the name of Jesus. And, and Peter said, is it better to obey God or man? Which was obviously, to the religious leaders, that would be a rhetorical question. Uh, they could not answer any way other than God. And, he said, and basically what Peter tells them is, uh, in this as well as other occasions, is we saw Jesus, we touched Jesus, we were with him after his resurrection, we are witnesses of what happened, and so we're going to tell what we've seen and heard. Uh, and, and so that's what he's saying here, uh, that God's witness is that Jesus is his son. And it's interesting, how, how did God witness that Jesus was his son? We talked about his baptism. He spoke from heaven, and the Holy Spirit came down. Uh, what, what's some other way that he did he raised him from the dead. That certainly spoke uh, witness to him that he was his son. What other way possible? If you go to the end of the Gospel of John, what does it say there that Jesus did? Remember? No, not the end of John. He was transfigured. And that, but that, and that would be witness to him because he spoke from heaven then. And, 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 but at the end of John, he says many other signs and miracles Jesus did, but these are recorded that you may believe. Uh, and, and so he says, miracles that Jesus performed were proof that he really was the Son of God. You remember, the one that always stands out in my mind was when the, they brought the paralytic man, you remember the guy with the paralysis, and they laid him down on his cot through the roof, and Jesus said, uh, take up your bed and walk, and or no, he said, your sins are forgiven. And, and they said, who is it can forgive sins with God alone? And he said, so that you know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. He looked at this guy and he said, take up your bed and walk. And the guy picked the guy up and took up his bed and walked. Uh, Jesus had the ability to show 
uh, that he was the Son of God. And he did that in many, many, many ways. We look at the miracles of Jesus, and I know I've mentioned this before, but we look at the miracles of Jesus, and so many of them are recorded. You have him, you know, healing the lame and healing the blind and healing the deaf person. He, he healed people with leprosy. He healed people that were paralyzed. Uh, he stopped an issue of blood. I mean, you did, you name it, and he healed it. And yet, there are so many passages that says that he healed all that were in that region, or he healed many others, or he healed all the sick. I mean, there were literally hundreds, if not thousands, of people that Jesus performed miracles on during his ministry. I mean, it, it was just, and that's why John says that many other signs did Jesus do in the presence of these witnesses, but these are written that you may believe. Jesus did lots and lots and lots of miracles to show that he was the Son of God. It says they came from all cities around. Yeah. That area, and he healed all of them. <laughs> yeah, and, and several times he mentions the fact that they brought them, brought people, you know, be in a town, and they brought people, everybody in the whole region that was sick, and he healed all of them. I mean, it's just, it's the, the number is uh, totally unknown, but there were lots and lots of people that Jesus healed. So it wasn't, you know, if, if I came along and I claimed to have worked a miracle and I healed somebody that was saying, Somebody that was blind and, and I gave them their side back. And that was the only miracle I ever performed in my life. There probably would be a lot of people that would doubt that and probably spend a little bit of time proving that I really didn't do that because it was, it was just one time and that was it. Maybe that guy had something wrong that, you know, he got better on his own. Who knows? That, that's one thing, to do one miracle even if somebody did that. But to be able to perform all of the different miracles and the different kinds of miracles, even stopping the storm by telling it to stop and, and other things like that, and feeding the 5,000, feeding the 4,000, and so on. The, the list of kinds of miracles just goes on and on that Jesus performed. All of this is witness from God that Jesus really is the Son of God. And John says these things were written so that we may believe. So it's not just for the people then, it's for us too. Everybody reads that. So, you know, we have the miracles of Jesus to prove to us that He really is the Son of God. One who does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God makes him a blame because he does not believe God's blame. The one who does not believe makes God a what? A liar because he does not believe God's testimony. Okay. What he's saying here is God says Jesus is my son. And if you say he's not, then you're saying Jesus that God is lying. It's, it's what he's saying. You're accusing him of lying if you don't believe it. And, and so we, we need to understand the seriousness of believing in the miracles and so on. What is the testimony or the record that God has given us? Eternal life. Okay, eternal life in His Son. I think that's interesting. He says, and this is the testimony. Now we've talked about the testimony of God in showing that Jesus was His Son at His conception by showing Jesus was His Son in His life and the miracles He performed at the baptism and the transfiguration. Uh, we said Jesus is shown to be the Son of God by His resurrection. Uh, even His ascension shows that He's the Son of God. So all of these things, the fulfillment of prophecies, which we didn't even mention, shows that He is the Son of God. So all of these things show that He is the Son of God, but He says the testimony that I'm giving you is not so much that Jesus is the Son of God, but rather the testimony I'm giving you is that you have eternal life. Because you believe in Him. You're putting your faith and your trust in Jesus and the testimony from God is that you have eternal life. And so the testimony that we're talking about here, even though He talks a lot about Jesus and who He is as the Son of God, the, the basis of the testimony or the actual, the actual testimony itself is that we do have eternal life. 
This is one of the things that's, that stands out in the book of 1 John, is the absolute assurance of those who are believers that we have eternal life. Uh, there's no way to really study the book of 1 John and go away, if you're a Christian, to go away from the study of 1 John without a, a complete assurance that you have eternal life. When this life is over, you're going to be with God. That's, that's the whole purpose of why he's writing this book, is to give us that assurance. And he says it many different times in different ways. And so verse 12 then, question 15, what determines whether we have eternal life? Okay. Okay. He who has the Son has eternal life, he says. He who does not have the Son does not have eternal life. Explain that. Okay. If we are in Christ, we have the Son. That's what he's saying. If, if we are in Him, then He is in us, we have Him. And so he, he's saying that we either, and this goes back to something I said, uh, I think last week, and maybe the week before that too, but in the book of 1 John, there are two kinds of people. You either are in Christ, you have Christ, you're in God, you have God, and you have eternal life. Or you're not in Christ and you're not in God and you don't have eternal life. And there's not anywhere in between. If you look through John, it's either you acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God and you have eternal life. You love your brother and you have eternal life. You acknowledge God as the Father and you have eternal life. You have the Holy Spirit living in you and you have eternal life. Or you don't acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God and you don't have eternal life. You don't love your brother, you don't have eternal life. You don't obey His commandments, you don't have eternal life. You don't have God, you don't have eternal life. And so He, he gives you these options all the way through, but it's just two. There's not any other options. You either are or you're not. You're in or you're out. And, and so for those who are in Christ, we have God, we have the Holy Spirit, we have Jesus. And, and we have eternal life. And he says, this is the assurance because you have that. He says, now how do we know if we have that? We know it because we love our brother. We know it because we keep his commandments. We know it because we serve him as God. We serve Jesus as our Savior. And so, he said, this is how you can know. And he also said, because we have the Holy Spirit in us. Does that answer that? Okay. Why did John write these things? So that we may know we have eternal life. Verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay. That's your way of life. That's what you said. Yeah. That we continue to believe and continue to know that we have. Have you ever heard a lesson? It may have been in a class or it may have been a sermon or it may have been in person or on the radio or something else. And then sometime way later you wished you could remember all of what was in that lesson. Uh, <laughs> I've had that a lot of times. And the one that stands out probably the most in my mind was way back in, let me see, it would have been probably 1974, maybe 75, somewhere in the, the early, mid-70s. Mid we were living in Jacksonville, Florida. There was a guy who came and held a meeting at Post Street Church of Christ, which was on Post Street in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, and we had a, a good friend whose mother attended there. And so John and Jen called us and said, why don't you go with us to Post Street tonight to hear this guy preach? And we went to hear him preach. And he preached. And the text of his lesson was this verse. Uh, John wrote so that we may know we have eternal life. And it was an excellent lesson, but I don't remember a single point that he made in that lesson. Uh, and I don't have any idea who it was that, that preached that time. I don't remember his name. 
And most streets in our church is not even there anymore, so you can't go back to the past. Uh, but, but I often would thought that I would love to have his lesson to look at it and see what he said. I remember thinking it was an excellent lesson and it was really good, but at that point I was still struggling a whole lot with First John, and, and a lot of it didn't sink in. And it may be that I've told you everything that was in his lesson already in, the, in our class and just don't know it. You know what's sad? And, and you hear him today uh, of, of people uh, that go all the way to their deathbed and they, they have the same, the same notion of, I just hope I'm good enough or I hope I can make it to heaven. And you know, think back of, no matter how old they are, that they've lived their life with with that notion of I don't know whether we're going to heaven or not. And I mean, it's, that's such a sad, sad way to leave. Uh, especially if, if you get to this text, and you not come across that and say, oh, well, I can't have that assurance. Uh, it's it, it's got to be a sad life, but I'm yeah. uh, wondering if you're, yeah. if you're going to make it. Yeah, what for those on the internet who listen to Bruce was saying that it's a sad thing that they can go through life wondering if they're going to be saved when they die. Uh, wondering if they really are saved or are not saved and so on. And, and I, I think yeah, I agree with you 100% it is a very sad thing. I think that it would be easier for you to understand why people think that way if you were about 40 years older. Uh, not because the age would give you wisdom, but because you would have been through a different time. Uh, and some of you understand what I'm about to say, that, that many of us, when we were growing up, heard many, many lessons that basically said, if you're good enough, you're going to heaven. If you're not, you're not. Uh, and that's I can totally remember false. when do what? And that's totally false. Yeah, it's totally false. But I, I can remember some of the first sermons that I ever preached on grace were considered to be somewhat radical lessons. And there were people that got really upset with some of the things that I said because it went against everything that, that they had been hearing and been, been taught. Uh, and because their whole concept of being saved was if you're good enough, you can. And if you recognize your sin and you repent of it, then God will forgive you. But if you don't ever recognize and don't repent of it, then you're lost. And their idea of walking in the light was, and I heard them explain it this way several different occasions, the idea of walking in the light was as long as you were doing what was right, you were walking in the light. As soon as you sinned, you were in darkness. And then when you repented of it, you figured out what you were doing wrong, you repented, then you were back in the light. And so you were saved while you was in the light, you was lost when you was in the darkness. And so if I happen to be in the darkness the day I died, then I'm going to hell. But if I happen to be in the light, I'm going to heaven. So, uh, you know, there was no assurance to it whatsoever. And there was no continuity of anything. And, and that's the way that many my age, and even a little bit younger, but my age in particular, were brought up in the kind of lessons that we heard. Uh, I, I think as I look back, my dad was somewhat of an exception to that uh, because he did believe in grace even back then. Uh, but, but it was not the, the common thing that most Christians heard. I want to do and I'm not doing it. But he said, 
that I'm being forgiven through Jesus Christ. I think that, that our heart, and this is a place that only God can measure this, if our heart is right and we want to do what's right and we're set on doing right and we're working on doing things better and continually improving, then I think that that is what he's talking about walking in the light. If, if we are not and we just say, okay, I know, but I don't care, I'm just not going to do what God wants me to do, then that's not following God. Joe? Uh, we've already talked this earlier in this, in this book here, but uh, first chapter, first God.
to those who are in Christ. And the law of sin and death is the wages of sin is death, and the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And he says, if we are in Christ and our sins are being forgiven, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We're not going to be held responsible and, and put to death for it. And so we have that assurance. And I think there's passages throughout, it's not just these, but there's a lot of them that show us that we can be continually forgiven and, and have this assurance that we have. All right, any question, comment, we know about it. Okay, we will stop right there and pick it up next week for you.
guilty sod and to become the Lamb of
Let us bow as we offer thanks for the bread. Father, as we gather around this memorial table to, to partake of these memorials, so help us to let our minds go back to that day that Christ suffered on the cross, gave his body and his blood that we can have forgiveness for our sins. Bless this bread now as we partake of it. Represents his body that was so cruelly crucified on that cross. Help us to remember that as we partake. And do so in a way and manners pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us pray again. Our God and Father, we come to you again just so thankful for the love that you've shown for us, the, that you sent us your only Son to come to this world and to, to die on our behalf. And Father, we just pray that we'll always remember what Jesus did for us and the pain and agony that he went through. And Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents that blood, that we'll take it in a manner that's pleasing to you and that we'll take our minds back to that cross. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. I force to continue to think about the sacrifice of Jesus as we sing number 217.
Thanksgiving week, and I probably could or should have preached a lesson on Thanksgiving, which I didn't do, so I thought we'll at least sing a song about Thanksgiving. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us, for the night's rest that we have gotten, that we're able to be here this morning to glorify your name in songs, prayers, and reading of the word and hearing your word taught to us. Thank you, Father, for the many wonderful blessings of this life that you give us. 
thankful for all the blessings that sustain us while we're here upon this earth. And we're thankful for all the things that you give us to make our life just a little more easier and have a little more joy. Father, we are mindful of those of this number that are sick and not able to be with us. And Father, we do pray for them and pray for the means that's being used to restore them to their better walk of life that they may be with us once again. We are mindful of those that are going through testing and other things concerning their medical health. Father, that you would be with them, that whatever is done will be done for your glory and it will help them to get back to their much wanted places in life. We're also mindful of those of lawful loved ones recently. And Father, we pray that you be with those families and help them to receive comfort from you and help us to give them comfort as well. Father, we are so thankful for this congregation of people that choose to serve you. We're thankful, Father, for all the men and the women that participate in various activities of the church here at Ephesus that makes things go smoothly and that provides a service to us all. We're thankful for Brother Robert and Matt as they labor here with us and that they spend hours each week preparing lessons. And Father, we pray that our minds will be right with you when we come in, that we can hear these lessons and that we, we can leave this place and give you honor and glory in the way that we behave. Father, we're mindful of the elders as they have taken the oversight of this congregation. And Father, we continue to pray for them that they will receive your word on how to better guide us and that they will lead us in paths of righteousness. Father, we pray that each one of us will behave in such a way that it will make their job much more easier. Father, we are so thankful for the blessings of this congregation. Father, we ask that you be with the men and the women of this congregation, that you would help them to have uh, interest in the classes that are outside of our normal Wednesday and Sundays. We pray, Father, for the men's class as they meet every two weeks on the Thursday and for the women's class that we meets once a month on Saturday. We pray, Father, that you'll help us all to have a better intentions to attend these classes and find a better way to serve you and to build each other up as we attend these classes. Father, we ask you to be with us through this lesson. Pray that the speaker of the hour will have a very good recollection of the things he wants to say, that he will be able to say them to us in a way that we can understand and that we can use them in a practical way in our everyday walks of life. Be with us, Father. Forgive us of our sins and help us to desire that home in heaven. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I was thinking about songs that had to do with being thankful, and I couldn't think of a song that expressed anything we all have gratitude for any more than having Jesus as our friend. And so we'll pick this song for that. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to quench and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. Strong and mighty God, I am offered. 
the lesson be number 389. Let me just say we're glad you're here. Uh, my batteries are showing red, so I'm going to take them out so it don't quit during the during the sermon. I want to just begin this morning by telling you that the lesson that I'm going to start this morning, I don't intend to finish it. Uh, I'll finish the one I got ready for this morning, but it'll be a one to follow, at least one to follow afterwards, uh, hopefully next Sunday night. Uh, but this was requested by someone, and so uh, I think it is something that we need to look at. Uh, and I'm going to approach it from a little different way than I've ever looked at this particular passage uh, before. Uh, I'd like for us to think about the fruit of the Spirit, as mentioned in Galatians chapter 5. And the context of that uh, is beginning in... Is beginning in uh, verse... 16, and we'll read all the way through the end of the chapter as we introduce this subject. Here Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another and envying one another. As we move into this lesson, the first thing that came to my mind is what does Paul mean by the fruit of the Spirit? Well, in trying to understand that in my mind, the first thing I think of is when we're talking about the Spirit, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so we're talking, not talking about just our personal Spirit that we have living in us. We're talking about the, the Holy Spirit. And the word fruit just simply means in this context the result of the Spirit living and working in the child of God. So as we look at this this morning, we're talking about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, working and living in the child of God. And so then the question came to my mind, well, how does the Holy Spirit live in us 
or dwell in us. And what does he do? Now, in thinking about these two questions, there are a number of things that I thought about. One is that there are those who, who believe and teach that the Holy Spirit only lives in us through the influence of the Word of God, and so we study God's Word, and by the influence of His revealing the Word and, and so on, then it's through that influence of that that we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And I, I reject that idea because that would mean then that the Holy Spirit lives in everybody that ever reads the Bible and has, is influenced by it in any way, and I certainly don't believe that's true. I believe the Holy Spirit lives in us in a very personal and, and real way. What does He do for us? Well, He does a lot of things for us. And so I want us to go this morning and look at some things regarding the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I freely admit that I'm talking about a whole lot of things this morning that I don't totally, 100% understand myself. Because we're talking about God. The Holy Spirit is a part of the Godhead, a part of the triune God. And for me to say that I understand the Holy Spirit and all there is to know about the Holy Spirit is the same thing as saying I understand God and I know all there is to know about God. And that's somewhere between absolute ridiculousness and blasphemy to make that kind of statement. And I certainly don't, and I freely admit that. But I think there are some things that are told to us in Scripture that will help us to better understand. And the purpose of this lesson this morning is to lay the groundwork for hopefully beginning next Sunday evening talking about the actual fruit of the Spirit that's listed there in Galatians 5. But I want us to go this morning to begin in Romans chapter 8. And beginning there in verse 5, and it is a little bit of a lengthy reading. He says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who indwells you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the flesh, or the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. The first thing that stands out to me as I read this particular passage is that we choose, each one of us individually chooses, whether we're going to serve the flesh, and that just simply means serve ourselves and satisfy our own personal desires and do what we want to do. We either choose to serve the flesh or we choose to serve the Spirit, which is the same thing as saying we serve God, we serve Jesus Christ. And so it's up to each one of us to make that choice. God's not going to make the choice for us. But rather it is up to us to choose that. Look at verse 5 that we just read. There he says, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So Paul says, each one of us makes up our mind and we set our mind, we're going to do this. I'm either going to serve God or I'm not going to serve God. In our class in the auditorium this morning, we were discussing the book of 1 John. And one of the comments I made was that in the book of John, which is true with, really with all of the New Testament, there are just two kinds of people. There are people that serve God and people that don't. We either serve the flesh or we serve God. Every one of us fits in one of those two categories. And it is up to us individually to make that choice to decide if we want to serve God 
or we don't. And God will let us make that choice. There are consequences, but He'll let us make that choice. The result then of serving the flesh is death. And he's talking there about spiritual death, eternal death. He says that's the result of serving the flesh. But when we serve the Spirit, he says we, are, we have life and we have peace. And if you look at verse 6 that we just read, For the mindset on the flesh is death, and the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. So we make that choice, and when we make that choice, there are consequences. So we either choose to serve God, and we can have life and peace, or we choose to serve ourselves, and we will suffer eternal spiritual death. We can't do both at the same time. That's why I say that we have to make the choice, and we're either one or the other. Now, you can choose not to serve God, and in doing that, you have made a choice, to serve Satan, to serve the flesh. If you choose not to serve Satan and you choose not to serve the flesh, the only other choice then is to choose to serve God. And so we cannot do both at the same time. Jesus, you remember, said you cannot serve two masters, either love one and hate the other, hold one and despise the other. We can't serve God and material things at the same time. Look at verse 7. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So if a person is determined they're going to live for themselves and they're going to do what they want to do, they're not going to listen to God, he says that kind of a person just totally ignores God, ignores the law of God, And they may be what we would call pretty good people. But if they're not set, if their mind is not set on serving God, then he says they are hostile to God. And they're not even able to follow the law of God. Because if your mind is set on serving the flesh, you cannot serve God. And he goes on and he says that as a child of God, Christ lives in us. But he also says that God lives in us. And he tells us that they both live in us through the Holy Spirit living in us. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit living in us, we're talking about God living in us. When we're talking about the Holy Spirit living in us, we're talking about Christ living in us. If we talk about God or Christ living in us, we're talking about the Holy Spirit living in us. He says all of them live in us through the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 9. There he says, However, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed... The Spirit of God dwells in you. And then he says, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So here we have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, used interchangeably and synonymous, meaning the exact same thing. And then he says, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But notice verse 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that is, God raised raised Jesus through the Holy Spirit, we're told. And so that Holy Spirit lives in us. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who indwells you. And so we see that the Holy Spirit living in us, Christ living in us, God living in us, are used interchangeably in these verses 9 through 11. And so we need to understand that when we're talking about one, we're talking about all of them. I want to digress just a moment from the book of Romans and go over to the book of Ephesians. And notice that Paul says the same thing to the Ephesians. In chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians, there in verses 13 and 14, he says, In Him, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. And so he tells us here that the Holy Spirit lives in us, that is, those who are believers, those who are disciples, those who are children of God. And then in chapter 2, in verses 20 through 22, he says, Having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus Himself 
being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. And so Paul says again that God lives in us by the Holy Spirit living in us. And if we go over to verse chapter 3 and verse 16, 17, he's praying here for the Ephesians and he says, My prayer is that He would grant you according to the rich of His glory, to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able, and he goes on with the prayer. So here he says that Christ lives in us through the Holy Spirit living in us. And so I think that this is something that helps us to understand the concept of the Spirit of God living in us. As a child of God, the Spirit lives in us and works in us. And it's by the power of the Spirit living in us that we put to death the deeds of the flesh. And he says that we are led by the Spirit to be what He wants us to become. And if we become what He wants us to be, then we will do what He wants us to do. Now going back to Romans 8, beginning in verse 12. So then, brethren, we're under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So he said, tells us again that the Spirit of God, this, the Holy Spirit, same thing, living in us. One lives by the other. And he says it is through the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. We just saw over in chapter 3 that we're strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in the inner man. In Ephesians. Here he says that you're putting to death the deeds of the body and you're being led by the Spirit of God. Now, if we go back to Galatians chapter 5, this time just looking at verses 16 through 18, we'll see that the Spirit lives in us and that He leads us. As we look at verse 16, he said, I say walk by the Spirit. It is live according to the Spirit. And you'll not carry out the desires of the flesh. But then at the end of verse 18, he says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And so we are led by the Spirit when the Spirit lives in us. In 2 Peter chapter 1, there in verses 2 through 7, this is what we sometimes refer to the beginning part of the, the Christian graces. But notice what he says. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now he tells us that we can become partakers of the divine nature and that's by the Spirit of God living in us and leading us. But then notice what he says. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith supply, and then he lists these things, moral excellence and self-control and so on and so on. And if you look at these, they're very almost, not exactly, but almost parallel to the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the reason I bring this up is because some people have the idea in Galatians when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit that God is going to somehow just sort of miraculously put this in you and in your heart and in your life and all of a sudden you're going to be filled with love and joy and peace and goodness and all these things that are listed. And I have to confess that at one point in my life I sort of felt that way. I wouldn't have said it, but I sort of felt that way. And then I began wondering why does this not work? And what Peter's saying is, if you want these things to work, you've got to work on it. Applying all diligence in your faith supply. That's you doing it. Now God's going to give us the Holy Spirit to give us strength and the ability and lead us, but it is up to us to make the decision to do it and put forth the effort to do it. He's not going to miraculously do it for us. The Spirit lives in us and He leads us. He guides us. 
Not only that, He empowers us. But He is not going to do anything against our will. We have to put forth diligence and use His power. Remember Paul over in Ephesians chapter 6 where he talks about the spiritual warfare? And one of the first things he says is stand in the power or strength of His might and having done everything to stand. We stand and we battle in the power and the strength of the might of God and the power and the strength and the might of God in us is the Holy Spirit living in us. And so we have to put forth diligence then to use what He gives us to become what He wants us to be. We supply or we add to our faith as He leads us. In Ephesians chapter 4, there in verses 1 through 3, he says, Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I therefore entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Now that's up to us to do that. We have to make that choice. And he says, We can choose to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we have been called. In verse 3, he says, Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so we have to do it ourselves, but we do it with the power of God. We do it by faith in Him. We do it trusting in Him. Dropping down to verse 20 of the same chapter of Ephesians 4, he says, in reference to your former manner of life, verse 22, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. He says, you do this. You put it aside. Now, we have the power of the Spirit to do it, but we have to make the decision and we have to do it. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new self. But then notice what he says. You put off. You put on. But then he said, put on this new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. That's God working in us. God has created in us through our efforts of working, but through the Holy Spirit, He has created in us righteousness and holiness of the truth. And so the fruit of the Spirit is going to come to our lives when we put forth an effort to to make them happen in our lives, but God causes it to happen. We're not left on our own. We don't make this renewal by ourselves. But it's through the Holy Spirit living in us that we have been created in righteousness and holiness. And the Spirit is working in us and He's changing us and and molding us into His image so that we can be partakers of the divine nature. Paul in writing to Titus says in Titus 3, verses 4 through 8, When the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration. And I believe there that He's talking about the, the idea of when we are baptized into Christ, it is a washing of regeneration. We become a new person. We become a child of God. We become, become a babe in Christ. And so this washing of regeneration refers to our, our baptism into Christ. But then He says, the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit does His work in our hearts and our lives, and He changes us. So it is the renewing by the Holy Spirit whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So when we're baptized into Christ, we become a Christian. He gives us His Holy Spirit who does work in us and change us. That being justified by His grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement concerning these things I want you to... Speak confidently so that those who believe God may be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for them. So we have to work at it. It's not going to do it for us all by himself. We have to put forth the effort. And that's a part of our commitment to him and serving him. But he'll give us the power and he'll give us the strength so that we can overcome the flesh. We can overcome the deeds of the flesh. We can overcome sin and be what he wants us to be. Look at Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 7. He says, Therefore do not be partakers with them, and the them he's talking about are the 
if you go back to verse 6, are sons of disobedience. That is those that, that refuse to serve God. Do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you're light in the world. So walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. You see, the Spirit's not going to give us miraculous knowledge or make us something that we don't choose to be. So we've got to study God's Word and we've got to continually try to learn more about God and what He wants us to be and He will empower us to understand it, He will empower us to live it, and He will help us. But we've got to make the choice and we've got to put forth the effort of studying and growing and becoming what He wants us to be. In Colossians 1, for this reason also since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So he says you've got to study and you've got to work at it and, and you will continue to grow and continue to be what He wants you to be. But notice what he says in the next verse. Strengthened with all power. Where would that power come from? Remember what he said in Ephesians 3? He said that power is the Holy Spirit living in us. And that's so Christ may dwell in us. So strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness, patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. And then going over to the third chapter of the book of Colossians, there beginning in verse 12, he says, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. That's something we do. We, we understand we've got to do this. So we put on a heart of compassion. We choose to do that. Humility, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bearing with one another, forgiving one another. These are things that we have to do. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love. So we have to do that which is the perfect bond of unity. But then he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, so that you may indeed, so to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And so the Holy Spirit works in us, and He gives us this peace in our hearts that is beyond understanding. And so yes, we do, there, are, there is a sense in which we do have to work for all of this, but at the same time, there is a sense in which the Holy Spirit gives us power and strength and He does put a new spirit in us and a new heart in us so that we can be more like God and molded into His image. The Spirit lives in us and He leads us. He guides us. He empowers us. But He doesn't do anything to us that's against our will. So we choose to do His will. We choose to let Him lead us. But you know, if we are a child of God and we don't follow His will. It says that we grieve Him when we know what His will is and we don't do it. And we don't let Him lead us. Look at Ephesians 4 verse 30. He just says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And it's interesting there that this verse is right in the middle of a whole bunch of verses of Him telling us how to put off the things of the flesh and to put on the things of the Spirit. And right in the middle of it, he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, make sure that you're doing what you ought to do. But then if we continue to ignore Him, and we continue to push Him out of the way when He's nudging us in our hearts and our minds, we can eventually cause Him to just give up on us and let us go our own way. And this is what he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, and verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. One translation says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. You, you can just get rid of them if you want to. Do not despise prophetic utterances. And to despise prophetic utterances just means to ignore the Word of God. And so as we study the Word of God and we put it into practice, the Spirit works in us to help us become what He wants us to be. And so we'll talk about the fruit of the Spirit. As I mentioned, I want to get into the specific fruit of the Spirit that's listed next week on Sunday evening beginning. But as we look at the specific fruit of the Spirit that's mentioned in Galatians, we need to understand that it's not going to be miracle fruit. 
He's not going to just say all of a sudden, okay, I'm going to put all this stuff in you and you're going to be this kind of a person. Because it doesn't work that way. It takes time, it takes effort on our part. But with the help of the Spirit living in us, it's sort of like adding miracle grow to flowers. Because we add miracle grow, the Holy Spirit, to our lives to help us grow and develop in becoming partakers of His divine nature. Everything we've talked about this morning is for those who are already children of God because the Spirit of God only lives in those who belong to Him. So this morning, if you're not a child of God, you can come to Jesus and confess your faith in Him as Christ, as the Son of God, as the risen Savior, and then turn away from your sin and repentance and you can be baptized into Christ. And you'll be raised to become a new person in Him. And then as His disciple, you'll be given the Holy Spirit to live in you and help you be molded in His image. So this morning, if you need to make your life right with God, I want to encourage you to come this morning as we stand and we sing this song. Sing number 865. After this, going to ask Matt to lead us in closing prayer, and then we'll be dismissed.
you, O Lord, our God, and we are thankful for your love for us and all the ways that you have blessed us and given us the strength, given us the ways to know your will, to know your word, and to know how you'd have us to live. Father, we thank you for your word and what it means to us, and we thank you for your Son and for the Spirit, and we thank you for all the things that you've blessed us with. We're mindful of this week of all the things that you have blessed us and we give thanksgiving back to you for everything that we have in our lives and above all those things we are thankful for your son and the life that he lived and the death that he submitted to to save our save us from our sins we pray that you'll forgive us from our sins as we repent of them and father we have those who are here who are hurting and mourning lost loved ones and we pray that you'll be with them and comfort them those who are recovering from surgeries and we pray that you will bless them with a speedy recovery that they may be back again to their full waltz of life very soon we pray that you'll be with those who are constantly undergoing different procedures and treatments and we pray that you will bless them and father we pray that you will heal them Help us to always praise you. Forgive us from our sins. In Christ's name, amen.